Welcome to Saturday's Warrior. I'm Trevor, and this is the podcast where we talk all things BYU and Big 12, but we also cover a lot on realignment, and we have been doing a series of the ACC Spotlight where we've been going around the conference and interviewing people uh, representing different uh, fan bases throughout the ACC to get their perspective on ACC, on sorry, on uh, realignment and how they think it'll affect them and their schools and how it's going to play out. And it's been great because um, we've recently rolled out the college huddle and we actually have Ben here from the Bowl City coordinators here, who's also a fellow member of uh, the college huddle joining us today to give us the perspective of Duke through all of this madness. Ben, thank you for joining us. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me on. I'm glad to be a part of the college huddle and I'm repping my wife's uh, uh, master's program school, Ohio, go Bobcats, which heck, I mean, Duke may end up playing them in football pretty soon. We'll see. I don't know. <laughs> I don't think it'll come to that, but you know, at this point, I believe uh, just about anything. So, um, so if uh, you're watching, you haven't already, please uh, give us a like, uh, subscribe to the video as we continue to put out these ACC spotlight videos. Now, Ben, um, we have so far focused on some of the schools that are getting most of the limelight in the um, in the ACC throughout realignment that everyone's talking about, your uh, Florida State's Clemson, even a UNC. But right now we're talking about Duke. And now Duke for me is maybe one of the most interesting cases in the ACC because it is a big brand. That is a household, or, you know, a nationwide name brand throughout household. Everybody knows Duke. They know that logo. They know the Blue Devils. Um, and yet it everything we hear is that there's no room for Duke in one of these power conferences and that the case may be that if it came to it, maybe even the big 12 wouldn't be interested in Duke. Now it may never come to that, but why do you feel like um, um, that's the discourse around Duke and realignment right now? And is it fair? Well, I think it is fair. Although I did hear, and I don't pay too much attention to conference restructuring because it drives you insane. It's worse <laughs> than recruiting. But the, the problem that Duke has, and I've talked about this a lot on my, my podcast, Bull City Coordinators, is that Duke essentially ignored its football program for 30-ish years. And as the ACC, or excuse me, as the SEC and as the Big Ten and as other schools in the ACC were investing in the football program, we, you know, we remember the track, right, at the horseshoe. We remember the pretty bad, uh, well, just the, the, look, the seats are terrible for a long time. It looked worse than a lot of high school places. Okay. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. I, I really enjoy going there and I have a lot of fun, but even wake figured this out before Duke did. They're like, you know, we got to up our football program. We got to compete. Right. And then Duke finally came around to it. Duke's just been behind on football and the recent hires of Elko and Manny Diaz, I think it will obviously starting with David Cutcliffe have, improve that a lot and things have gotten better, but there's just not much of a, of a football brand there and football is everything in realignment. So if you're looking at from a conference perspective of what is going to drive our best television deal is going to be North Carolina, North Carolina state, Wake or Duke. And obviously North Carolina and North Carolina state are going to be at the top of that list. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, Duke's football obviously is not where some of these other programs are, but they've also had some decent showings over the last several years. I mean, up and down. I mean, generally, I think, I don't know, actually, I probably should have looked into this, uh, but I feel like most years it seems like Duke is at least making a bowl game, even if it's, you know, just the, the, uh, what is it? The Mayo bowl or whatever, uh, something like that. We'll but, take it. We'll take it, man. <laughs> but you know, you're getting there. So it's not like, you know, you're winning three games a year or something that you're, you know, getting bull eligible, which is good. And there and, was a time when three years, three wins a year was great for us. Cause I remember <laughs> those years. 
<laughs> so you think, okay, that's something to build off of, and it is a name brand. You're in a, a great state. You got a passionate fan base. You got a huge rivalry. Like in many ways, I think rivalries drive a lot of this. You talk about brands. I think rivalries are huge. Having UNC and Duke, um, you'd think that there would be some appeal there, um, but yet still not a lot of traction, which I get. But, um, you know, it, it does seem um, also a bit a bit crazy uh, to think about Duke not uh, not bringing some of that value. But like you said, it's all driven by football. And if the numbers aren't there, they're not there. Yeah. And to steal a line from Joe Ovius, Duke and UNC is a great football game, but it doesn't have any sizzle to it. Mm. It's the UNC NC State game is a much bigger game. Mm. right and just it's unfortunate but that's just the way that it is so duke has had a lot of investments we'll just go through since 2008 they've been to one two three four five six seven eight bowl games and they have a conference division title okay uh but at best that's what average above average maybe probably mid-tier it just the basketball team is the draw everybody plays their best against duke everybody wants to beat duke in basketball but that's not what drives these contracts so you know there was some talk about the big 12 wanting to be a really really dominant basketball conference and kind of reaching out to some of these schools i I mean I, i don't know the big 12 just seems culturally a lot different from a small private school that has not done a good job admitting students from North Carolina into its student body. Yeah. Yeah. Culturally it'd be a bit odd. I mean, we saw um, Brett Yormark wanting to get to the West coast. And yet at the end of the day, they, you know, there were no traction with Stanford or Cal. Again, I think that cultural fit just uh, wasn't there. Um, And so it'd be interesting to see how, big of a role that would play going forward. Um, so let's say hypothetically the ACC, you know, Florida state and Clemson are successful with their lawsuits. The ACC falls apart, whatever people are going everywhere. Um, and you see several schools, maybe going to big 10 sec, uh, maybe the big 12 grab some, let's say Duke is not part of that. And there's a handful of other schools. I think we all know who they are. Most likely Boston college, wake forest, probably Syracuse, maybe some others, right? Georgia Tech is a wild card. I could see them going all the way to the Big Ten because of their market and their academics and all the way down to like not having a home. So I I would believe any of those scenarios for Georgia Tech. But so let's say there's a handful of schools in the AC. Oh, and that's not to mention the newcomers too. So a handful of schools um, when all said and done left in the ACC, how do you see that playing out? Do you think, or, and, and what would you like to see? Do you, would you like to see, try to, rebuild grab some local you maybe south florida or yukon or whatever and try to cobble together the acc and bring it back together or would you just prefer everyone kind of went their own way and you went and found a a new home elsewhere or how would you like to see that play out and how do you think it'll play out i have no idea how it would play out but i think it would not be great for for duke i think it would be problematic for duke and i think it would be hard potentially to find a home I think Wake's going to be in that same spot, right? Miami should have a landing spot at school. I mean, how? anyway, that's a whole other thing. (laughs) But what I'd like to see is a a conference made up of Duke, UVA, Georgia Tech, NC State, UConn, Wake, Clemson. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'm fine with Cuse. I'm fine with Pitt being in there. Uh, I'd love to have Virginia Tech still be there and that other school with its pale, ugly blue, whatever that school is. So, I mean, honestly, I I would like to see the conference stay more or less the way that it is now. Um, Having Stanford, Cal, and SMU in, I know people have dogged that, but – the member schools wanted more money and that's really the only thing Jim Phillips could do to get more money. So I don't have a problem with those. I, I'd like the schools to say to, I, I would like the conference to stay the same. I know that's not going to happen, but 
I just want it to survive long enough for Duke to have a good home to be in. But I, I don't see Duke going to the big uh, the the Big Ten. I don't think the Big Ten would be interested. I, I don't think the SEC would be interested. Maybe the Big Twelve would be just because of the basketball element of it. I mean, the, you know, the that conference has done really well, and it's got a really good basketball program. And it may say we want to be the premier basketball conference. We know we can't be the premier football conference because of the SEC and the Big Ten, but let's be the premier, the premier basketball conference. So maybe Duke finds a home there, but uh, I mean, I don't know what, I mean, what happens to all these other schools? I mean, this restructuring stuff, maybe a whole new conference springs up. I don't know. It, so you already mentioned Duke, maybe not being the best cultural fit. I know it's ideal to keep more um, regional rivalries. Like you'd much rather be with these, you know, these teams that you're familiar with, that have tradition with Duke, but let's say it comes at the end of the day that, a handful of schools, you know, there's only a handful of schools left and you can try to stay with those few schools and cobble something together or go to the big 12 where maybe you don't fit in quite as well, but at least there's stability and you're not making, you know, big 10 SEC money, but you're making pretty decent money, especially compared to the alternative. Like how would you, pref- you know, rather see that go? Would you rather stay and make a lot less, but at least be with some regional rivals or make it into the, the big 12 and have some stability? Well, so I would love to, and I'm looking something up here to make sure that I get the right, the right teams listed. Okay. Um, I would, I am a fan of the smaller regional conferences because you have those rivalries and you can easily go see the team play somewhere else if you want to. Okay. So I would like for that to continue. I I don't know if it's going to continue or not, but, I would like Duke to have a home, but if you're asking me, do I want Duke to play SEC teams? No, I don't care. I don't care if we play LSU. I don't care if we play Vanderbilt. I don't care if we play Ole Miss, Mississippi. Who cares? I don't want to listen to Rocky Top. Okay. I just, I don't. The Big Ten teams, I, the most overrated basketball conference. And up until Michigan won this title, them and Connor Stallions, an overrated football conference. Okay. Yeah. But here is here. And I know I'm on a big 12 podcast, so I have to, I have to be polite. But if you're asking me, do I want Duke? Do, am I going to invest in Duke playing UCF, the university of Cincinnati, Iowa state, Kansas state, Oklahoma state, TCU, Texas Tech, and West Virginia. No, I'm not. I'm not. Well, I mean, I could go to West Virginia and see him play there. That would be easy, but I don't. I mean, it's going to be harder for me to care about that. And so I don't know wonder, how you feel as a BYU fan. Oh, well, just to clarify, so you would rather make less money, but have maybe if it's not all your rivals, at least a portion of these teams that you're familiar with. Uh, more locally than go get a bag and play all these schools that you've got no history with. Correct. I would much rather at this point, see... it's one or the other. Ideally, it would be make a, you know have all these conference. You know, it's this eighty conference. You know, super conference that they've talked about and ten regional divisions where you know I, I did a video on that and broke them all out and basically that I have the original ACC back together plus Georgia Tech plus Florida State. You know, that would be 10 teams right there. And it would be great. You know, you're reestablishing all these these uh, regional rivalries and these these old conferences that used to be together. But um, so, yeah, that's that's ideal. But that's interesting that you value that more. And there would be stability in that because that's part of why the Big 12 is stable is because they're not too worried about getting rated at this point because the teams that have you know, the most value have already left the conference. And so uh, there is that level of uh, stability. But um, to go back to your question, what do I think is BYU in terms of playing Duke or just in terms of who we play or, or, or what? Well, I, yeah, I mean, I, so I would love for me for, because see, I think that, that what we're seeing is is a big disconnect between the fans and the administration. 
Mm-hmm. Like the fans want to see these rivalries continue, and they want to see their team have an opportunity to compete and win. The administration is wants everybody wants to be Maryland. They just want to go to a new conference, make a lot of money, and be largely an also ran, right? <laughs> yeah. But as a BYU fan, I mean, you've kind of gone through this a whole bunch, and you you've been around. I mean, I don't know if your perspective is I'm just glad we're in a home and we're stable. Or it's I don't really care about these teams we're playing. I mean, I, I don't know. Um, it's sort of both, right? And so BYU throughout their history has been in a lot of different conferences. Traditionally, we've always at least had the familiarity of Utah. And that was, you know, during independence, obviously we didn't have that. We played them most years, but it, it was, you know, a very different situation. So during a realignment, yeah, we're just we're really happy to be in a conference and uh, and be at a power conference, like finally have made it, you know, that's definitely changing our program. We see like the hiring of our new, um, basketball head coach. We lost our coach. You know, we got a new guy coming in from the NBA ranks. He was the highest paid assistant coach in the NBA. We got him to come down to BYU. And so we can see that. I mean, that's a lot to do with uh, boosters, but it also shows that the program now has financial resources that we didn't have before. So yeah, we're enjoying all of that, but in terms of rivalries, um, It's true. Like we did not have a big history with most teams in the big 12, even like, even when you just look at like the life, you know, most of these series of like, yeah, they played once in the forties, once in the seventies. And now we play, you know, this year or whatever. It's like, okay, you know, Texas tech or who I can't remember is two and O against uh, BYU before this year. And it means nothing because those are, you know, everyone that played on those teams is, is dead or, you know, really old at this point. So, um, so there is a lack of history other than, you know, TCU. And now we're bringing in uh, the four corner schools where there's more history. But one thing I will say about the big 12 is it wasn't just a lifeline for BYU. Uh, but I feel like BYU still fit in pretty well culturally with a lot of these other schools. And so there was a good fit, even though there wasn't a lot of history, it felt like BYU could fit in pretty well. Uh, we were a little bit further out geographically than, than most of the other schools, especially when you look at the Eastern side, but um yeah so there i guess i would say a little bit of both but byu is really happy to have the stability and while there's not the history now i think we look forward to developing that history um with uh with these new rivals and so yeah you're right like playing duke is exciting but i i'm with you in terms of i would love to go back to more regional rivalries and and have it spread out how having said that byu is also benefit benefited from all this madness by the fact that you know, there were spots open up in the big 12. And so it's, it's hard. Cause it's, you can't have your cake and eat it too. It's like, we've benefited. So I can't complain too much. Uh, but on the other hand, yeah, I hate seeing these rivalries torn apart. You know, I've seen what's happened when we had our rival, you know, taken from us and, and then we played a bunch of teams, you know, different teams every year and that you didn't have that same level of continuity. So, um, you know, would it be fun to have Duke come all the way to Provo and play a basketball game? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but you're right. There's not that same level of, of, uh, of history there. Well, that was and a as a fan, to answer to your question, what's no, but, but I mean, like as a fan, like one, like let's say Duke's in the big 12. Yeah. Okay? I don't care about playing Colorado and I'm not going to be able to go to Utah consistently. This team right. Play, right. And it's, 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 it's further taxing the fans. Right. So what I would love to see happen to avoid this problem separate and let's have the Olympic sports have their own conferences. And I mean, the Big East has it, man. The Big East has it. They've got the best basketball environment. They've got the best basketball tournament. I mean, bring back that old ACC style stuff. And I hate to be that old guy talking about it, but I mean, if you're I mean, really like if you're BYU and you're saying Duke football's on our schedule now, we got to play them every year. I mean, you're not going to care. It would be great for me right. because I'm on the East Coast, so I might. Let's you know, just be real. You're not going to care. more, and you. Should, I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I don't know. It, I mean, I just. I, it's not. Well, um, so going back to rivals, so 
there is UNC and this whole day, uh, this whole thing with uh, them and NC State. And so uh, this isn't Duke specifically, but I'm not sure if you're familiar with, um, you know, that they're apparently tied together and how rock solid that is. Because I feel like if that is something that they're not able to break out of, I don't know if that to me seems like it would be a detriment to them being able to get into one of the power two conferences, just because there's just not that many slots left. Yeah. I, I don't know exactly how that situation would play out, but I think the idea was to try to do what Virginia did to force Virginia tech into the ACC. Right. But I don't know how that's going to play out. That's unsettled. And I, I don't know. I, I, that, that's that's a big unknown. That's just a big unknown. And then another another question I had, because this comes up a lot. I've seen a lot in comments in, our, in uh, my videos. So I do read the comments. So please uh, let me know what you think about Duke and where uh, they'll, they'll end up and uh, throughout all this realignment. But um, one thing I have a question. A lot of people say you know this school won't get in to here whatever is because they're not um they're not flagship universities uh this is a land grant school um and one thing i i get that those types of things were important to an extent at some point much like you know the 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 big 10 says the aau is is important to them but uh, could you explain why that is important and what why that would make some schools a better fit versus maybe uh, a private school or an, a public school that isn't a, a land grant or, or flagship university. Yeah, I think it's the, uh, um, it, there's a, an acronym for it and I can't remember what it is, but it's membership in a certain institution that means or a certain organization that means you're one of the top academic facilities to that's important to the big 10. Cause I think all of their schools, all their member schools are part of that. So I think that makes it harder for Florida State. I don't remember if Clemson meets that criteria or not. For some reason, I, I had it in my head that it didn't, but I could be wrong, so I don't want to speak to that. But Yeah, they don't. What I think it means is UVA. Yeah, I, I think I think it means. All right. Sorry, I think you cut out. We're kind of having bad connection. Uh, you cut out for a second, but um, – so anyway, yeah, so that that to me, I think, is an uh, um, interesting component in all this is how much do a lot of those, you know, a lot of people throw a lot of those reasons out there why one school will go somewhere, one school will go another place. But at the end of the day, I think, uh, you know, it seems really be driven by money and the money makers are ultimately football in all of this. And uh, um, how big do you see these conferences getting, do you think there's a limit to that or they're just going to keep, you know, grabbing more and more schools until they feel like they've got all the good brands that are left? Or do you think that there's kind of a cap at which point you're kind of in or out? Hmm. I'm trying to think about that. And I was looking it up. It's AAU membership. That's what I was thinking of. I always think of the basket basketball program but i think every school i'm looking at it now except nebraska but nebraska was at the time that it joined every member of the big 10 is uh, is a member i i don't know i i think it's all going to depend on how good the tv dollars are i mean if there's more tv money and more tv money there's no reason not to expand if the money is there right so it could get really big but i, I think one thing that we want to keep in mind as we're talking about conference restructuring is it would not surprise me if uh, litigation and legislation surrounding employment of students really put a wrench in this. You know, Dwayne Carter's got his lawsuit going now about trying to get money shared down to the athletes and to the students. So that could really put a little bit of a wreck on this if you get to where these schools are unionized, or not the schools, the, the students are unionized and have the ability to collectively bargain for some of these benefits. And if you get into employment, I, I, I don't. So to go, go back to my classical antiquity fondness in the Aeneid, there's a line about how 
Aeneas is supposed to go create an empire without end, meaning Rome. And the idea is Rome's going to expand forever and expand forever and expand forever. And Rome got pretty darn big, but then it started to collapse and contract, and it was a very slow burn, a very, very slow burn, until Constantinople fell in, I think, 1453. So I'm just saying this stuff does and expand forever there's good times and there's bad times there's boom times and there's bust times and i don't know where we're headed next i'm not smart enough to to have that access to the crystal balls of the tv deals and the markets and kind of how these networks are changing and the the streaming services are changing i, I don't know what the money's going to be like and we can guess and we can talk about it and but i think it would behoove all of us just to say there's some stuff we just don't have information about. And I think that this is one of those things we just don't have information about because we don't know. You and I just probably don't know enough about what the inside of those TV room meetings look like, you know? But I just, from a historical perspective, things don't always expand. Eventually they contract. That's interesting. I like that perspective. I mean, some people have thrown that out there that at some point schools could be expelled from these bigger conferences. You talk about the the chaff, the, the dead weight in the, your Vandys or your Purdue's and I'm talking football, right? Obviously Purdue did well in basketball, but um, as a lot of these schools do, do you think that uh, if that becomes the case, that you could like form an egghead conference that like Duke and Vandy, Purdue and uh, some Wake and some of these other guys could get together and form really good at basketball, very just okay at football, and uh, you're all really smart. You know, I, I it would not surprise me if the money is such that the best football schools, the Alabamas of the world, right, just say enough. And you know, the Michigans of the world just say enough of these irrelevant teams taking money that should belong to us, right? And then that could create this other option of maybe we have the second tier relegation type of a, an arrangement. You know, I don't know, but it's possible. But I, I think the, the solution gets a little bit easier if we can just separate college football and the Olympic sports. Yeah, And we can have a lot of this really, really good stuff because the the money with football, it, it's just so different, man. I mean, it's just so, mm -hmm. so different. But, you know, uh, to quote Michael Scott, anything's possible. Yeah, no, I, I think you're right. And, and I think that's the way it's headed in terms of football ultimately doing its own thing. And I think that's the best for everything because to be putting, you know, to having – Stanford and Cal and you know, I don't know what all um, Olympic sports you guys all share in common with the ACC, uh, but, you know, tennis teams or whatever, cross country or, you know, row, you know, crew or, you know, I just try to think what all the time, like it's, it's, I mean, it's doable, you know, especially if there's enough money in it for these programs, but um, certainly not uh, the most feasible and, and probably hard on, you know, they've talked about student athletes, even though travel's getting better, but it just seems ridiculous. And so you'd think yeah, at some point, let these other sports play those more regional rivalries. Families can go and support these, you know, programs because uh, let's face it, they don't get a, as much viewership. They don't get as much attendance. And so, um, yeah, I, I think that's ultimately where it's going. The question is, how are these football conferences going to shake out and um, I think once we get some settlement there, then maybe we see some sort of, you know, breakaway, um, which um, is in, in too bad in some ways, but there's no putting the cat back in the bag. Like it, it's out. Pandora's box is open. Uh, we're not getting college football back to the way it was. And so now the best we can hope for is that it gets salvaged in, you know, the, the cleanest way possible. And I think everyone's debating now what that means. Yeah, and and honestly, look, we're going to be dealing with this for a while. I'm trying to pull up the article that I did on this quite a while ago about the ACC and restructuring and what it meant. Uh, but um, these TV deals, they start to run out around 2030, right? They, yeah. they, the AACs does. I can't remember when the Big 12s runs out. 2031, maybe? Yeah. yeah, I mean, all this stuff...
which is what I call the Big 12, 2031, and the SEC deal is 2034. So we're going to be in the thick of it really soon. Oh, don't tell me that's really soon. Time's flying. It still feels